get your chance later, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks uh, again. Well, last speaker, uh, last but not least, and take the floor. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to address uh, this audience on this very interesting topic. I think you all have heard about Abraxane, uh, so I won't belabor it too much, but uh, it's a nanoparticle with albumin, and that's sort of the key feature. It has a surface coating of albumin, which is cross-linked in a specific way with a specific manufacturing process. And uh, it's approved in three indications today in metastatic breast cancer, lung cancer, and uh, most recently in pancreatic cancer, and we expect uh, sales this year to exceed a billion dollars. So uh, the, the key feature of this is that it's a complex 3D structure, as you can imagine, for a nanoparticle. And uh, it has a solid core, which contains the paclitaxel, and it's surrounded by a coating of albumin, which is cross-linked uh, into uh, different oligomeric forms uh, because of the specific process that is used to create it. And it has a distinct morphology and uh, sort of high degree of rugosity and uh, high surface to volume ratio. Uh, and, and you see uh, sort of two features. This is a cross section of the particle, but uh, ultimately this particle uh, ends up into the individual albumin bound paclitaxel uh, molecules in the circulation. And I'll speak a little bit to that. Uh, so what's in the bottle um, or the vial? Uh, you have the nanoparticles, of course, which are of uh, a specific size range, roughly around 130 nanometers. But in addition to the nanoparticles with their coatings, you also have different albumin species. And uh, this is where sort of the complexity uh, arises uh, as well. Uh, other than the fact that we're creating these 3D structures. So you have different albumin species that are cross-linked into different oligomeric forms. So you could have a single albumin, which is monomer or dimer or trimer or oligomer or polymer. And then uh, the paclitaxel is bound to the albumin. And each uh, albumin can bind many different paclitaxel molecules. And as you increase the size of the oligomeric species or the polymeric species, the affinity for the paclitaxel changes because larger molecules or larger polymers can ha have a higher affinity for the paclitaxel. So again, once again, uh, you're talking about differences in complexity depending on which species you're looking at. Uh, well, what happens in the circulation? Once the paclitaxel uh, or the particles are injected, uh, they break down over time. And that time frame is sort of defined roughly over 30 minutes or so. And, and then create all of these different species. So you have intact nanoparticles, and then you have these complex species, which are the polymers bound to albumin. It could be monomeric albumin uh, bound to paclitaxel, and then some free paclitaxel molecules. And presumably there is some equilibrium between all of this. But it's a very dynamic process in going from the nanoparticle to these species. So this is quite unlike, for example, liposomes uh, or doxyl, which was mentioned here, which is designed to circulate intact as a liposome and get to the site of action. Here, these are designed to, in fact, break down upon uh, injection, and then uh, you know, various biological transport features occur. Uh, further complicating the issue is uh, each of these uh, albumin species, if they're monomeric or they're polymeric, they can be cleared by different receptors uh, for albumin. So, for example, we say like a GP60 receptor clears monomeric albumin, but there's the higher, uh, the, the scavenger receptors like GP18 and GP30, which are known to clear polymeric albumin as part of normal albumin homeostasis. So, so once again, based on the complex mixture, um, you have different uh, biological processes occurring, which eventually lead to uh, the transport of the drug out of the circulation. So, so here's a cartoon that sort of depicts that entire process, and it probably doesn't do it justice, but just to show it in one slide, you have the particles, and as they come in, uh, they start to break down. Some of these intact particles make it out of the circulation. Uh, this is the blood vessel into the tumor. Others are uh, broken down into the albumin, various albumin species we just discussed. You have a specific caviolar transport process that is triggered by binding of receptors and you get transcytosis and then uh, the transport of drug into the interstitium of the tumor, and that's uh, how it ends up there. Uh, so, so if you look at the structure, uh, 
you know, there's clearly the surface. And uh, one of the earlier uh, talks uh, did mention one of the EMA reflection papers with the importance of the surface coating. And, and we believe the surface coating here is important as well. Uh, the albumin is, is cross-linked into specific uh, and distinct forms, and that may, in fact, help hold the nanoparticles together uh, and provide some uh, stability. On the other hand, the core is uh, paclitaxel, and it's a conventional paclitaxel is crystalline, but within the nanoparticle, the, 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 the process that we use to manufacture it does not create crystalline paclitaxel, but it, in fact, creates amorphous. Paclitaxel. And as a result, these particles can dissolve very quickly. Uh, it's um, in a readily bioavailable state, if you will. Uh, so it can bind albumin and, and, and affect the transport. The manufacturing process, like for most nanoparticle products, uh, and we heard this also in the previous uh, uh, speaker's presentation, so the manufacturing process is essentially the product. It's a highly complex, multi-step process that results in a highly complex product. And so there's many controls along the way, and we have to make sure everything is just right in terms of all of the parameters to make sure you make a reproducible uh, product. And so clearly, any changes in this process, you know, you could think of temperature, pressure, uh, other conditions, flow, uh, that can create potential changes in the product. So we have to monitor each of these very carefully. And uh, we can change the composition uh, if, or the composition may change if this, these parameters are not effectively controlled. So uh, we heard the FDA's uh, talk earlier, and that there is, in fact, a guidance out there for um, follow-on products. And uh, that guidance um, came out in September, I believe, 2012. And what it recommends is, of course, the particle size distribution and specific characteristics like a D10, D90, and D50, and the span should be similar to the origination, uh, originator product, which is a Braxane. Uh, and in addition, the recommendation of a bioequivalent study uh, looking at uh, also unbound and total paclitaxel. Uh, and also recommended are several different in vitro characterization uh, tests, uh, which are listed here, which include particle morphology and size and crystallinity, free versus bound, uh, and, and oligomeric status of albumin in the excipient and the drug product. So, so this is a, it's a very nice list of tests that, um, that should be done in order to assure some level of sameness. But uh, the, we believe that there's a few more that's needed because uh, the, the complexity of the product and the different species that are in the product uh, cannot be fully characterized by this list of, um, uh, of items in the paclitaxel guidance. So the question is, what are those additional studies? And we've looked at this uh, reasonably carefully. And the question is, do you need immunogenicity? Do you need clinical studies? And we'll discuss that in a minute. Uh, uh, immunogenicity, as you know, for nanoparticles uh, and nanoproducts may be a key issue, uh, depending on uh, the, the type and composition of the nanoparticles. So in this case, we have a protein. And in turn, that protein is further cross-linked to create uh, if you will, a non-native albumin. Uh, and the question is, so what does that do in terms of immune response, uh, you know, when you put it into a human? Um, it, it's complex structure. It's a mixture of a small molecule and, in fact, a, an approved biologic, which is albumin by itself. And, and furthermore, the particles, as I mentioned, are designed to dissociate. So it's not just looking at the nanoparticle as it's circulating. In fact, these nanoparticles are breaking down as they circulate. And that introduces a whole other level of complexity uh, when you think about bioequivalent studies. So there are copies of Abraxane. We call them the purported copies because we don't believe they're true copies, but uh, based on the analysis that we've done. Uh, but there's copies, and there's, in fact, three uh, copies of this product uh, in India. Um, and it's Albipax, Paclion, and Paclitax. And we've uh, analyzed, in fact, all of them and I'll just show you some of the results here. Uh, we've, in fact, filed a citizen petition where we've publicized these results, and so I encourage you all to take a look if there is interest. Now, uh, it's very likely that each of these products have a 
different manufacturing process from each other, and in turn, which is probably different from a Braxian, uh, as our process is proprietary and uh, you know trade secret, in fact. So uh, alternative manufacturing processes for these complex products, what does it do? Uh, I, I think based on our own experience, we would think that it results in at least a slightly different product. And we've tested these, and, uh, and we'll show you some of these results uh, here. Now, uh, a key f thing we always talk about is size uh, in the context of nanoparticles. So here's uh, actual data from these different products, including Abraxane data and some of these copies. And you can see here just a volume-weighted um, diameter like a D50 is, is different in some cases, but is similar in other cases. If you look at the span, it's similar in some cases. It's quite widely different in other cases. Now remember, these are marketed products uh, which are supposed to be copies of a Braxane, but we can just in this test of size, you can clearly look at the size distribution and say that, okay, these look different. So what's the impact? Uh, clinically, we don't know because there's no clinical data on any of these copies. Of course, we have our data on a Braxane across three phase, large phase three trials. So, so can these properties result in different in vivo behavior? I think all of you in nanomedicine will agree that if the size is different, then yeah, you could expect some differences in behavior. Uh, now, I wasn't, I'm not going to spend the time to go through the litany of all the tests that we've done, but on the left side here in this column lists all of the guidance uh, tests that are listed uh, in the FDA guidance, and we've looked, uh, we've tested all of these products, the three different products here for those uh, different properties and different tests. And the ones that have X's marked on them uh, are ones that did not meet the specific test uh, that we did as compared to a Braxane, and the ones that are check marked met the test. So if you go down the list and just look at the crosses and the checks, you see that there's not a single product that actually uh, has all check boxes marked off in that meaning that it has the same properties as a Braxane. So, so clearly, these products are all different. Um, uh, in, in addition to these tests, I mentioned that we believe additional tests should be done to sort of further characterize these products. And this really uh, gets into, for example, the surface coating. Uh, you have to isolate the nanoparticles. You look at specifically at this coating and the albumin and try to test that uh, for, for different uh, properties. And the, the simplest test you can do is how much protein is there on each nanoparticle. And that's just one test. And if we look at these three uh, copies that are out there, you see some differences in uh, the, the, the results of these tests. So a different amount of protein for each nanoparticle. What's the impact of that? Uh, we don't know for sure, uh, but it potentially could uh, impact in vivo behavior. Uh, looking sort of at a different level at the surface coating, you could look at the, the oligomeric status of the protein on these coatings. And so you can identify how much monomeric albumin there is, how many dimers or trimers or polymers. And, and for these three products, once again, if you look on the monomer, dimer, oligomer, polymer columns, you can see that these numbers are quite different in looking at one product to the other. So clearly there's differences even within these copies, and each of these is different from a Braxane. So what is the impact of that? Uh, maybe this has got to do with cross-linking of the, the surface protein, so it could impact stability. Uh, maybe immunogenicity, depending on how it's cross-linked and the protein, how the protein is modified, and potentially safety and efficacy. I mean, we don't know the answers to all these questions, and uh, these are difficult questions for us to answer. So, so let's look at one that we can readily measure, which is uh, stability. And we've developed this test, which is really a very simple test. Uh, is uh, each of these products is a lyophilized product. You reconstitute the product, and then you subject it to some stress conditions to see how these nanoparticles hold up. So here's a photomicrograph of a Braxane uh, on the left. Uh, so essentially, in 24 hours at an X-rated condition of 40 degrees, uh, the particles are stable and you see no precipitation. But in one of the copies that I showed you, or in fact, a couple of them, uh, you see extensive precipitation. So what does that mean? There's clearly the particles are not as stable as a Braxane. Uh, 
Um, so there are some differences. What exactly contributes to that instability, we don't know. It could be the coding, it could be the way it's put together, it could be the interaction between the, the paclitaxel and the albumin. It, it, it's hard to, to determine uh, what the causes of all of these are, but we can see through some functional tests that, in fact, there are differences. Uh, so through this additional test that we just talked about, uh, we compared, again, uh, the, the three products, and none of the products actually compared adequately to Abraxane. And similarly, on those functional tests, such as the reconstituted product uh, held at 24 hours, 40 degrees, uh, none of those uh, compared effectively uh, uh, with Abraxane as well. And there's some other tests that we recommend on crystallinity and uh, filtration uh, through a point to micron filter. You know, very straightforward tests. So, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about immunogenicity and so, yeah, wrap up uh, two slides more. Uh, and uh, so the binding of paclitaxel uh, can change uh, the immunogenicity of albumin, and this has been shown in some animal studies. Uh, so, so if you have different manufacturing processes that re result in different binding, then it's possible that you're changing the immunogenicity. Now, and as you know, animal models are not always predictive of these type of immunogenicity where you can generate antibodies against uh, a product. Uh, and, and so how do you adequately assess that? Maybe you need clinical studies to um, adequately test immunogenicity. Uh, the, the traditional PK bioequivalence is a big question here for nanoparticle products, not only just Abraxane, but in general. So, so we have uh, taken our data on, uh, we have extensive PK data, and we've done modeling on that data. And this is an important uh, slide. On the left is shown the plasma PK uh, characteristics, and on the right is, a, is modeling, but this is the, the potential PK that is, uh, or rather the, the, the amount of paclitaxel that ends up in the tissue, so for example, in a tumor. And when you change some of the parameters, uh, the, in the modeling, you see that there's not much change. There, there's five different curves here. They pretty much all overlap. So you do not see a difference in the plasma key, a PK. And the type of parameters we're changing uh, is related to distribution of the drug from the central compartment into the tissue. And, and the importance of this is because our particles are dissolving in the, for example, over 30 minutes, that is the same time course over which the drug is being distributed rapidly out of the circulation. So if there are some differences in the dissolution characteristics of the particles in vivo, then you might see dramatic dis uh, distribution differences on the particles as they uh, uh, get into the tissue. And this is seen in this model that basically you cannot see differences in the plasma PK, but you can pick up dramatic differences in the, the, the paclitaxel in the tissue. And we published on this very recently, just 2015, so I encourage you, uh, uh, those of you who are uh, interested in bioequivalence and PK to, to look at this. Uh, yeah, the, the last slide is uh, on, on the intratumor distribution. So we can take different formulations and inject it directly into the tumor. And then uh, you can see that with Abraxane, you get a relatively broad distribution injected in, uh, once you inject it into the tumor. But if the formulation is different, for example, you use DMSO or you use cremophore EL or some other excipient, then the distribution is very uh, uh, different and, and narrow, and that, that can be measured very effectively. So even if the same amount of drug gets to the tumor, what happens in the tumor is different depending on the formulation. So that's sort of a take-home message for nanoparticles and Abraxane in general. So I, I think I don't need to, you can read this slide, but I, I, I'll just conclude, you know, we have a highly complex um, three-dimensional nanoparticle, and we don't fully understand all of the complexities. Uh, we feel that the current guidance is not sufficient. We hope to uh, negotiate with the FDA to add a few more tests to the current guidance. You know, traditional bioequivalence, uh, we don't believe is the right method. You know, plasma PK is not sufficient. Uh, you need to look at tissue, and then possibly clinical studies may be required uh, to, to test follow-on biologics. So thank you for your patience. <laughs>